Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Look at this. What, what I thought was going to be torture <laughs> turned out to be really nice. We got a little breeze going. Everybody has shade. Doesn't matter where you sit this morning. So this has turned out to be a really wonderful morning out here. Uh, praise God for that. I had no, no idea. Those of you at home, though, you could pray. I mean, this wonderful weather, overcast guy. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll get rained on. Wouldn't that be fun? And then you guys can have entertainment. They're all happy about that. Everybody wants some rain. Good. Uh, welcome, everybody, to North State Community Church. Uh, just a couple of logistics. If you're brand new here, there's a bathroom over there. Um, and so got that. And also thank you again for, you know, we're, the Adventist property, the Adventist church is letting us use this property, and we're just abiding by what they do and, you know, California guidelines and everything, so that's, you know, masks until you sit down, and then put them back on when you get up and go and be around each other and stuff. We just want to, we don't want to start getting sloppy, you know, we're getting all familiar around here, so keep doing that, um, so that's great. Also, we've got uh, some birthdays. Uh, and today we have, there's three birthdays um, today, and so with three birthdays, we thought we'd do something a little extra special. So we've got uh, Bailey's birthday, Ashley's birthday, and Jeff Vesley's birthday. And so we thought we'd do a very special happy birthday. <laughs> Your point at the microphone. I should. The folks at home, there was a bagpipe there in case you didn't see it. Here. Um, okay, also, uh, real quick update the uh, the salary team, we told you that a, a group of folks volunteered to uh, help determine what the salaries of the Montoyas and the Coxes could be. They actually did quick work. Um, and you will find on the back table both a, a recommendation of theirs with their thinking and their notes and all that. Uh, and also right next to it is another document, which is the monthly um, financial summary, which I actually sent out a couple of weeks ago. It's the same one uh, up to the end of July, but there's a, a printed copy there. I will also send out that recommendation today, what they are recommending via email. But if you want to get a hard copy, they're back there. And so now that means in the next week or so, if you could look that over, if you have any questions or input, uh, feel free to contact Trevor Davis. He's the treasurer and the head of that team or anybody on that team or if you want to talk to the Coxes or the Montoyas, anybody you're comfortable with. You know, we know with money and stuff it can be awkward, but please don't feel awkward. If you've got questions, if you've got comments, uh, please don't hesitate to ask or give your thoughts because we want to just be open about all this stuff. Okay. Uh, so there is that. Why don't we uh, pray, and then I'll turn it over to our worship leaders this morning, and we will worship God together and hear from his word. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that uh, we could gather here this morning to worship you. God, thank you for this weather. I didn't think I'd be saying that. I thought I'd be asking you to help us get through this weather, but thank you for... Um, providing for us a cover, literally a cover from the sun. Thank you. Um, God, we pray that you would bless us this morning here who are gathered physically and for those at home. Uh, God, let this be a special time for us. We pray that you would uh, transform us through your word. And as we lift up our voices to you, we pray that, uh, that you would hear the praise from our hearts. And God, we pray for our country. Uh, which is going through so much on so many levels, and it touches us here. Um, everything from politics to viruses to social unrest. Um, and God, we know that deep down at the core, there's just uh, a deep, deep, deep need for you. God, we pray that you would use all this adversity to draw people to yourself. And we pray that you would use all of this, God, to purify your people that you would uh, help us to focus in on what's most important. Thank you, Lord. Be with us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, everyone. Go ahead and stand up if you feel like. Oh, one me do. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. So you can stand or sit while okay. Trinity reads. Okay, we do a, a quick scripture reading and then is this on? And then um, a quick prayer. Okay, so this is from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. <clears throat> God, I just pray, uh, for, I thank you. I thank you that you are holy. I thank you that we can trust you. And I just ask that you, um, as we prepare our hearts for worship, that we will be humble and you will be pleased with our worship. In your name we pray, amen. Sing my hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness, when darkness seems to hide His face. I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of He is 
broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling.
And Lord, we are thankful for, despite the circumstances, we're able to gather and worship together today. And just open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Trinity. Uh, I'm going to invite the rest of the preaching team up this morning. So good. So good. We've got Anthony Ferretti, Deshaun Montoya, and Connor Klein sharing with us today. Well, he's really preaching today. He's I need my hands. <laughs> so I'm going to give you this one. Okay. But, uh, already, yeah. Uh, for those of you um, who remember um, when Mike Gabler shared a number of weeks ago, he coined this phrase, and that was a uh, season of suck, <laughs> um, which sounds abrasive to our ears, but it really uh, captures a lot of what we've experienced during the season. And last night I, I wrote a song called Season of Suck and I Marco poeted it to, uh, to Mike. And uh, it was just so much fun. So if you want to hear it, you'll have to bug Mike Gabler uh, for it. But um, I loved every single word of those songs um, that we sung this morning. My hope is not in coronavirus ending. My hope is not in life getting back to normal. My hope is in Jesus Christ. He is our cornerstone. He's our foundation. He's the reason why we gather today. And he's the reason that we actually get to experience peace in the middle of suffering, in the middle of hardship, in the middle of confusion, loneliness, anxiety, frustration, all that we're going through. He is the reason that we can actually celebrate, have joy, and experience peace. And for that, I am thankful this morning. So it's so good to just hear our church family singing out. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is not in waiting for the next season. Although we are waiting, we are anticipating with hope, you know, this uh, this season to end. But our hope is not in that. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. So we're looking at a scripture passage today in our First Peter series. We've been uh, going through the book of First Peter. It's called Chosen Exiles. And if you get rained on, just consider it such a blessing. I mean, it's been... 110 degrees, and as soon as we get a couple droplets of water, we're like, come on, are you kidding me right now? But enjoy it. It is like, <laughs> it is a gift and a grace of God. So we rejoice in the rain, especially if you get rained on. And there's canopy under the oak trees, so if you want to move, you can do that as well. So we're in 1 Peter 4 today. We're looking at verses 7 through 11, and I have the honor of reading those. Peter writes, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving each other earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> in uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the, the church in Corinth that when they gather, every single person has something to give. And in this passage that we just read, Peter says, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another. And today we get to do just that. Church is not the church when it's run by professionals. Church is the church when it represents the entire family. We at North State are family. And we get to hear from some of our family today. And I love this. Anthony, LaShawn, Connor, thank you for being here. And they've been praying into these verses and what God would have them share with us today. What does submission look like? What does to respect authority, what does suffering look like? These are all themes 
that we've encountered over the past couple of weeks. And today, a number of different profound thoughts that Peter is writing to the, the dispersed churches in Asia Minor have huge implications for us today. So, Anthony, you're going to kick us off. And I'm going to kick my one. water bottle over. I'm no professional like he's in, so I'm really nervous. So uh, let's start with, um, I have a little story. All right, so we're driving up to church today, and uh, I had my wife drive because I was uh, doing my last-minute notes. And uh, I was in Revelation 22, 12, and uh, I just, I reacted to this verse so so abruptly that she thought something was wrong. So uh, buckle up, here we go. It says, uh, this is... This is Jesus speaking. It says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And in verse 20, it says, Surely I am coming soon. So why am I sharing that? Okay, we're talking about 1 Peter 4, 7 here, where it says the end of all things is at hand. I'm here to remind you today that the big picture of what God is doing is, is his consummation of, of completing everything, his, his plan of restoration that includes a new heaven and a new earth. And I think that we... We can forget that. Uh, we get we get busy. We get in our day to day. We get so stressed out with with life and with all the things that that just consume our thoughts. And so I just want to take a moment in my five minutes to remind you that the big picture is Christ centered. He is the beginning and the end. And this end of all things that Peter's referring to um, is this this period of time that that was marked from Jesus' ascension, and this end of times goes all the way until the day he comes back. And scripture says that we don't know the day or the hour. So instead of focusing on trying to predict the end of times, because I think we could definitely do that in this time, um, day and age, and I could come up with a million reasons why uh, Jesus is coming soon, but that's not the point. The point is we don't know when, and Jesus is coming soon. He told us himself. And that is, in fact, very encouraging for us because we, as Christians, we don't belong here permanently. This is not our home. And like Peter is saying to this group of, of dispersed Christians, they're exiles. They're, they're not in their true home. Our true home is in heaven. And so that really puts things in perspective and when we get we get um, discouraged with with what's going on around us in life, um, it, it, I would encourage you to just take a moment and remember that we're going home. We're going to be in heaven with God. We will be seeing God face to face, and we will be with Jesus, who is already up there. And and, and I mean, if that doesn't fire you up, then um, I I got to keep going here. Then um, <laughs> so that, this sets the stage. Um, the reason why Peter's about to talk about what we're going to talk about is he's setting the stage by reminding us that the end of all things is at hand. And so the therefore is our instructions. These are, this is our call to action. What Peter's laying out is, is Christian conduct. It's how do we live? And we should live for God's glory. And so in the first six verses of 1 Peter 4, which or right before seven, he's, he's contrasting the worldly ways that they may have formerly been a part of as, as Gentiles. Um, they, th this audience is in a very pagan um, environment, so they're, they're really just, it's, it's a clear contrast from the way they used to be living to the way that is in Christ. And so, so we are encouraged not only encouraged, but commanded to be self-controlled and sober-minded, and we are to walk in the Spirit, um, and we, you know, we have the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, um, to be, to be self-controlled, sober-minded, patient, um, joyful, etc. And 
that is the that's the lifestyle that we are called to. And if you think that that's boring, if you're thinking, well, partying sounds a lot better, like Christians are just a bunch of buzzkills, I, I, I challenge you on that because if you really are walking with God and you're reborn and you're you're um, dwelling with the Holy the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you, you're you're going to be at war. Your your heart is is a battlegrounds for your former way of life that, that your flesh and your, your heart, your twisted, your heart's twisted desires want that, that um, instant gratification. But it's a battleground because in the spirit, we are called to so much greater. Um, and, and so that's where Peter's going with this. And um, last but not least, the, the prayers, he's saying, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. I had to really figure out what he's getting at. What about these prayers? Well, we're commanded to pray. And the reason we are to pray is that, that God uses our prayers to accomplish his sovereign will. Um, we're, we are a part of this process. God is in control, but for some reason, he has, he has decided to use our prayers to accomplish his will. And for that reason, we are commanded to pray without ceasing um, just to be on our knees praying. And, and when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, um, in there, it, it, he taught them a line that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven, um, so in earth. There's many different in translations. I probably merged them all together. But the point <laughs> is, he's saying, look, I'm coming back. And our heart and our, our minds should be saying, we want, we want your will to be done here as it is in heaven and we want your kingdom to come so that's the attitude we should have and i'll pass the mic on all right here comes the rain hold on people all right <laughs> so i am just covering one verse first peter 4 8 above all else love each other deeply for love covers a multitude of sins and this is actually the second time that peter in this book commands christians to work hard at loving each other first time is in the first chapter the Greek word that's translated deeply, earnestly, or fervently is ekteni, used to describe the muscles of an athlete straining to win a race. So obviously this kind of love is not easy. It takes work, and it doesn't come naturally to us. Just like exercise, you got to work at it to get better. Peter writes Christians should do this above all else. A follower of Christ must make demonstrating the love of Jesus to others his or her first priority. We are most like Jesus when we're loving people like he did. And Jesus obviously loved people to the point of death. Um, so this love is not easy. And we're called to do that same kind of sacrificial love. Um, it requires us to double down on our commitment to each other. This passage also says loving each other this way covers a multitude of sins. This is a little tricky. It doesn't mean that our acts of love for each other can earn God's forgiveness. It doesn't mean that we're paying our sins off through good works. We clearly know that we're only saved through the grace of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. So what does covers a multitude of sins mean? So Peter is talking about our interpersonal relationships here. As believers, we show the love of God by forgiveness, primarily, I believe. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. The first Corinthians 13 describes all the ways love works itself out, including keeping no record of wrongs. So when we love each other, we're willing to forgive and not hold our sins against each other. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 13, I'm just going to make a couple of comments on this. Love covers a multitude of sins and that it doesn't gossip about sin. Rather than share the offenses of our brothers and sisters in Christ with anyone who will listen, we exercise discretion and restraint. Another thing love does is it protects. It doesn't cover a multitude of sins by sweeping matters under the rug. Some people appeal to the forgiving nature of love in an attempt to hide their sins. For example, rather than report child abuse, a church might cover it up. This is not what true love does. Love protects by helping both the victim and the offender, and it also strives to prevent further offenses. Love covering sin also does not mean we disregard our own emotions or ignore personal boundaries. We can't cover sin by denying that it hurts us. We cover sin by acknowledging it, and then we can extend the forgiveness God has given us. And another way love covers a multitude of sins is choosing not to take, take offense at everything, and I think this is where the rubber hits the road. Um, some sins against us are just not worth confronting. 
Personal slights, snide or ignorant remarks, and minor annoyances can easily be forgiven for the sake of love. Proverbs 19.11 says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. If we're patient, not envious, or self-seeking, we're much less likely to take offense. Um, in my own life, I can think of numerous times when I've been the beneficiary of this kind of love from others. Um, as a child, uh, my parents overlooked many sins that I committed against them. Disrespect, um, being being selfish, being disobedient, arguing. As a parent, you know you have to forbear, forbear with your children, right? If you punish them or discipline them for every single time they didn't act in love towards you, didn't obey, you would destroy them. So we have to show grace. And God as our Heavenly Father shows us that same grace. And I saw it in my parents. And if you were killed by your parents, you would show grace too, okay? <laughs> um, I think about my sister. Growing up as the oldest child in a family, I was very bossy. I always got my way. She just kind of had to follow along. I didn't take her needs into consideration. That continued through as a teenager when I was really, really, um, sorry, we talked about this, but I had eating disorders and I was so selfish and she asked repeatedly to spend time with me and I just totally disregarded her because I only cared about myself and I hurt her deeply and she has forgiven me and shown me grace and I'm so thankful for that. My own kids have shown me grace. Um, for the many times I've yelled at them and lost patience with them. And arguably, arguably the human being I affect most in this life is my husband. Um, and Dave has shown me so much forbearance in our marriage. I become sullen and withdrawn. And I punish him with um, just being quiet and giving him the silent treatment. I get moody and irritable very easily. I become impatient when he takes too long explaining things to me. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> and he bears the brunt of my moods and emotions, being the person in the house with me. Yet he is patient and kind, and he has never once in the 32 years we've been married ever yelled at me, and I deserved it many times. So I experience daily grace through him. And lastly, sorry, I didn't mean to cry. Um, <laughs> Jesus asks us to show that same fervent love, which takes work to our brothers and sisters. And as a Christian woman in the church, I have experienced misogyny from Christian brothers many times. And it's been very hurtful, but God has given me the ability to forgive and give grace. And I think the more you see your own sinfulness, the easier it is to go, you know what, there before the grace go I. God's, Jesus' death and blood covers all these sins, the ones we do against each other intentionally and unintentionally. I know that these men didn't necessarily mean it personally toward me. It was just a disposition toward women, which is one of these sins that we have in the church, we have in the world. But Jesus' blood even covers that. And so our fervent love means we need to forgive. And I've been able to forgive these men. I can honestly say that I've been able to forgive them and let it go. And that's a miracle of grace from Jesus. So then in the context of living out God's love and how that can look for us, Peter then goes into um, one of the ways we can apply it in a verse that looks really straightforward, but actually implies a lot more. In verse 4, 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. To fully understand it, you got to understand what the Bible means by hospitality and what it means by grumbling, because he uses both. So when I first read this, when I think of hospitality, I thought of, you know, when I invite a friend over to my house, you know, cook them a meal, we hang out, spend time with them. Really simple. Then I thought a little bit deeper and maybe, you know, I have a friend who needs money for something or they need help with something and then I'm willing to extend that in kind of an open-handed way where I don't expect anything to re in return as another form of hospitality. And we could kind of go on and think of a lot of examples like that where it's little ways that we help people that we care about. But the way the Bible talks about hospitality is actually really extreme. If you go back to the book of Acts and look at the early church, their hospitality was literally somebody came into the church and they couldn't afford food that week. So somebody in the back was like, hey, uh, I'm going to go sell my house real quick. I'm going to pay for their groceries. Just give me a second. And they would go run and do that and then come back and give money to the church for people's food. So think for a second, if you did that, you went home and said, OK, that, yeah, the whole house gone. That's being sold. My Xbox gone. Get that out of here. We're selling all this stuff. We're going to go help people. It's such an extreme form of hospitality that we don't really think about. And in reality, it's actually more than an open-handedness. It's looking at the person across from you and saying, God's love for you is so infinitely more important than the stuff that I have. So I'm going to do what I can for you. 
And that's extreme. And a lot of times we don't think that way. We kind of, you know, go through our checklist of, okay, I did a nice thing today. I helped somebody out. You know, I'm good. And we don't really think about how much we helped them or how much they actually needed or the other people in our life that might have needs. And I also want to make it clear, I'm not telling everybody here, go home and sell your stuff. That's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is when we think about hospitality, you have to think about, do you look at the person you're helping and say, you are more important than the time, stuff, money, food, whatever I have, the love God has for you is more important than that. It changes the way you think about hospitality. It's bigger than just having people over, which is a good thing, but there's more. There's more to it than that. Our whole heart has to change about the subject, about how we think about the people we're helping. Then he says to do it without grumbling, which is also, sorry, I had a raindrop on my nose. It's also an interesting verse, the... Um, when you think about grumbling, you look at the early church and they had an interesting problem. An interesting problem that says a lot. Where you had the Jews in the church who had grown up in Judaism and come to become believers, but they were still holding on to their traditions and their laws and believed that everybody had to follow these traditions and laws. So when the Gentiles came into the church, they looked down on them. Because these Gentiles don't live by our traditions. They don't live by our laws. They're different. They're being wrong, they're the one in the wrong, we're going to look down on them and think we're better than them. Then you had the Gentiles on the other side who said, what's with these Jews telling us we have to live all these traditions and judging us for just wanting to believe in Christ? Like, we're obviously better than them because we're not judgmental. And you had this line in the sand and these two people that would grumble against each other and be angry at each other and be divided. But what a tragedy it is that that made its way into the church. What an absolute tragedy that we have a God who calls us into a family, and yet that's what the church was doing. Then I started thinking, you don't have to look very far out your window or on social media to realize we live in probably one of the most divided countries in the world, one of the most divided worlds that, or just one of the most divided times in the world that we've ever seen. I mean, I don't even have to scroll for more than two minutes on Facebook before I'm angry and want to delete the app from my phone. It's just, it's so, it's so hard. And when I think about that, and I think about how he paired this together, show hospitality to one another without grumbling, the question has to be, who do you grumble against? Like, take an honest look at yourself and think about whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, over the phone, in person, around other people, who is it that you grumble against? Who is it that just rubs you the wrong way, that you just can't stand them or the things that they talk about or the things that they say or believe in? Who is that person? Because this verse seems to apply that if that person were to come into this church and sit down next to you, would you be able to show them that absolute selfless love and hospitality that the Bible's calling us to? Would you be able to honestly look at that person and say, God's love for you is more important than my opinions of you and the stuff that I have? And this was hard for me to read because as soon as I read that, I didn't feel great about myself. I felt like, wow, I need to watch how I think about people because this is not okay. But that's the reality that we all struggle with, is that that's the time we live in, so we can't ignore that. We have to be willing to show that, that open-handedness, that selfless love, and be able to say, God's love for people is more important than whether or not they offend me, or whether or not I agree with them, or whether or not I have all this stuff that I don't want to get rid of. God's love has to be more important than that. Wow. <laughs> I got to tell you guys, everything that was just shared by these three is like, pure gold <laughs> legit like anthony this whole idea of keeping like a big picture we're so wrapped up in these small you know little concentric circles of our own you know life and experience and such and for us to remember the end of all things is near at hand i'm butchering translations you go, you too go. you know we, we all do this <laughs> we take the passage and or the past the passion version and the message version and the ESV and we, we kind of do that with it. But um, um, what a great, what a great just picture, like keep the, this big thing in mind. And then LaShawn, having known some of these, you know, stories and examples that you've talked about personally, you demonstrate gloriously when it talks about um, to, to look over an offense as to one's glory. And you bear that mantle of, of glory beautifully. And Connor, I, I don't know what you're talking about, man. You're one of the most gracious and hospitable people that I know. The way you've engaged um, with students and the way you go out of your way to 
to make other people feel like they belong. Um, and I've never heard you grumble once. Well, maybe I just got to get to know you. Guys. <laughs> but well, thank you guys so much for, for sharing this. That really is really is gold. Um, I've got the section that's talking about if anyone's received a gift, uh, use it to serve one another. Um, so first off, Peter makes this claim that everyone is is gifted, that everyone has some kind of gift, be it a spiritual one or, or a temporal one, an extraordinary one or just an ordinary one. And he says, in whatever way you've been gifted, use it to serve one another. Many people think that because they don't have a platform gift, one that's appreciated by the crowd, that they're not gifted or not as special as those who have one that draws a certain kind of attention. Some of you are um, are just like amazing at communication. Uh, there's many teachers in our midst, and it's been amazing to see the extent that these teachers are going out of their way to make their students feel welcome and at home, especially during these bizarre circumstances. Um, and, and you know, not just inside the context of their, their jobs, but outside of them as well. People in this group have the, the gift of encouragement. They're able to build uh, others up and speak life into home, hopeless situations. Some of you are gifted with numbers. How are you using that gift to serve others? Some are financially gifted. A couple told us at the beginning of COVID that they would help with anyone's rent if there was a need. And uh, we were able to, to pair them with um, some people who had a need. So those of you who are financially gifted, how are you using that to serve others? There's musically, physically, mentally, creative, creatively, administratively, not me, verbally, you're an encourager. How are you using those gifts to serve others during this season? Likewise, Peter also states that whoever speaks, and this is crazy, <laughs> let him take on with sobering and awe-inspiring fear that they're speaking on behalf of God. Who would have the audacity to stand up and say, I am speaking with 100% certainty on behalf of God right now. Sometimes I, I cringe a little bit when someone walks up and says, God told me to tell you as something like that can be abused easily. But God has also cho chosen his children to communicate his message of love to a hate-filled world. And when I grew up reading this passage, I always applied it just solely to pastors, those who fill the pulpit. But Peter's definition is a little bit broader, and he's actually talking to, to um, people who speak in a public, social, or even discipleship setting. That if you have been given a platform on which to speak, not a physical platform, and people will be influenced by what you say, then this is you. The implications of this are really scary. If we are to represent God in our public conversations, in social media, on Facebook, we had better represent God accurately. I saw a person, um, not part of this church, um, but I know this person, and they posted on social media this past week one of those forwarded prayers. And uh, the prayer said this, and I wrote it down. God, I ask you to protect this nation that you love, protect us from the evil country of China, that is threatening the United States, which is your country. And it went on. And I read this and I was filled with sadness, horror, and frankly, a little bit of disgust. If we are going to, as a Christian, put something out there into a place where we have influence, it had better represent accurately God's heart. The United States is not God's country any more than China is. In fact, nationalism, can detract from the citizenship that Jesus wanted us to proclaim. We are citizens of another kingdom. And when we put something out there, we, we've got to do this with, with reverence and humility to see that we are each a spokesperson for God. We represent him. And we will each give an account for that representation. Like Anthony said, when Jesus said, I'm coming in my reward, my my recompense I am bringing with me. We represent him. And any Chinese non-believer who read that forwarded prayer would immediately discount that person's witness and say, your God is bigoted. We have an awesome responsibility when we speak out. When we speak to a, 
to each other. Let it, let it be as if we are speaking the very words of God, what he would say to that person. We get to speak life. We get to speak healing and comfort, speaking hope. We speak purpose into desperate situations. And Peter says, whoever serves, let him serve with the strength that God provides. And he's not referring to serving in the Americanized church setting here. He's not just talking about passing out bulletins or music things like, like you did this morning, although we appreciate that. <laughs> He's saying wherever you're working, whatever job you have, whatever act of charity that you're doing, be it with the poor or with students or the people you're serving in hospice care, do it with the strength God provides. Another verse illustrates this clearly. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and not for man. Because you know it is the Lord you are serving. Since you know you will also receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. So if you're serving in whatever capacity inside your job, in your home with your kids, with the poor, helping a neighbor, something you don't particularly like or even feel gifted for, whatever it is, use the strength that God has given you. And do it like you're working for him. Like he's the only person that will see you and reward you for it. So all these things in this passage that Peter has talked about before, you know, being self-controlled to submit to one another, hospitality, serving, speaking. And he says all this, like LaShawn pointed out, is done out of love. If love is our motivation to see other people succeed, to see our country succeed, to be able to speak not conflict and division, but truth and life, knowing that we are wanting to accurately represent who Christ is, what he has done for us. He's the healer. He is the peacemaker. We get to be representatives of that. And that is an awe-inspiring responsibility. Dave is going to lead us into a, a moment of reflection. Who's got, you've got the mic. You got and uh, while he comes up, let's thank, yeah. thank these three. Um, let's just honor them. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, that was, uh, that was good. Those are good, good, good thoughts. And what we're going to do right now, um, though I tell you, each, speaker gave us um they, they, they didn't just do theology they gave us some real practical examples and, and things obviously when when we when pastors speakers whatever uh prepare a message it's got parts to it and you guys are used to this the last part is always well application right what 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 do you do with it well, we're going to do something a little different today uh, based on a, an ancient practice called uh, Lectio Divina, which means a divine reading. Uh, it's often done personally. It's something you can do on your own. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's just letting the Word of God, it's, it's, here, it's reading the Word of God, understanding the Word of God, and by the power of the Spirit, letting the Word of God transform you, change you into action. Um, it leads forth into application. So what's different is that we're going to take a little time. I'm going to read through the passage slowly um, in a moment. And the idea is for you to engage with God and ask the Holy Spirit to cause you to focus in on what you think the Spirit is. Of, the, several ideas were shared, four main ideas. What's the Holy Spirit asking you to focus in on? What transformation does he want to see in your life and what actions? So, questions to ask. So the, the first step is the, the, the reading or the understanding. We, we already did that. You heard the passage and it was laid out. The question, what does this text say that everybody should understand? Our four um, uh, presenters, preachers, basically told you what the passage means. But then you move into a, like a meditation and a time of prayer um, and contemplation in which you ask the questions, what does this text say to me today? And then what, Lord, and then what do you say back 
to God, as he's telling you what it means to you. And then the final question is, what conversion or transformation of your mind, your heart, or your life is God asking of you? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, and, and if you, you've got it printed on your song sheet, the, the passage, because uh, I really want you to be able to look at it. Um, but also, you could just close your eyes if you want. Um, and I, we're going to read it slowly. I'm going I'm to read one of the sections, pause, read, pause, read, pause. I want you to ask the Spirit to tell you which area that he's, He wants you to focus on. And then we'll, then we'll just have a moment of silence, of, of just silent prayer, where you can engage in him, with him, and ask him to, to, to speak to you of where he wants to bring transformation into your life. Okay? So, that's what we're going to do. Let me read this. First Peter 4, 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each one of you has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the very oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Take a moment, engage with God, and ask him how he would want you to be transformed in one of these areas. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You know, when we may do this in the future. I encourage you to do this at home. Um, 
The problem with when we pastors try to apply it is you can't make one application that fits everybody. And the Holy Spirit knows you well. And so it's always important that you would ask him. Um, and so this might be the beginning of a conversation with, with the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to keep that conversation going and be in conversation with one another as well. Um, if I could ask uh, whoever's you know, going to help with the doxology, we're going to sing our doxology together now and, and be on our way. Praise God for a beautiful morning. Oh my goodness. Well, Sean, we ran around trying to buy one of those little spritzer sprayer things, you know, because of the heat today. And God spritzed us all day. <laughs> it didn't pour. Um, I did. All right, let's do this. Or you do this. Oh, Jamie's coming good. Okay, good. All right, I'll step aside. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son.